So I figured I'd tell a little bit of the story of how we started uh, Boosted. How many here uh, have like, seen a Boosted board before? This is very odd because there was a time when it was just like maybe. Um, and actually, ironically, like some of my experiences at Cal were part of the thought process along with my co founders on like why is this board game to be able to be able to So I'll talk a little bit about that and some lessons from that. Um, before I talk about that stuff, and I'll get into this skip as well. How many people here like may want to start a company? Other people here are interested in entrepreneurship. Okay. All right. Uh, how many people here are majoring in technical things? All right. How many people are majoring in business and uh, I don't know, arts? Sweet. All right. Cool. Um, awesome. So I'll talk a little about like where some of these ideas came from. Um, I'm totally open to questions about what you do. Okay, so uh, this is one of my favorite shots. Like we, we actually do a lot of work with photographers uh, on this product, and it's cool because you know it looks like something out of an ad. And it turns out that um, you know this was shot by someone who was 17 or 23, and we had to get his mom's permission to pay him because he paid something. But like, what went into this is actually a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And so what I'll mostly talk about is like, Boost is a brand that a lot of you have heard of, and some of you have seen like, videos about it, marketing materials, and some like Facebook Max and blogs. Everything looks super, super produced. But behind the scenes of a lot of that, it's very easy, and this is something that we would not have known if we hadn't gone through some of the programs we did, of like, how do you actually um, work on the right things when you're trying to explore an idea like this, and what are kind of things that may seem like the right things for mine? Um, and so it's really easy when you're working on something like this to say, oh, well, I want something that looks good. And so I'm going to talk to you today about all the things behind what makes it look good um, so you get the fundamentals right, uh, because it's a lot easier to actually make this look good than have it look. Um, so I'll talk about how to do this. So the first thing that we started off with was, was being cheap. I think everyone here is familiar with that. Right? Being a student and also being a cow. Um, so the, the genesis of this was, was laziness, uh, mostly, and needing to get around campus super quickly. So I graduated Cal in 2005. I was an Emmy major in each minor. And I went to grad school at Stanford. And a couple of my friends who were at Stanford um, and I were like, just basically having to get a very spread out campus because we all had the same problem. Um, and we needed to go check on like what was getting built in some building while we're off to another building and have class in another building and all that stuff, right? So um, bicycles, major pain in the butt, skateboards, most of the driving. And so we were working in a robotics lab. Uh, how many people here know who Bob Fuller is in the LSB? In the biology, he does like gecko and cockroach robot stuff. And that stuff. So I worked in his lab, and we were doing basically gecko robots. And so these motors, uh, back in 2011, those little red and black things on the end there, what was now on the boards that I see in the room, those are the same motors that drones were using. But at the time, there was no drone industry. That was like 2011. And then this, this battery here is also a battery from like an artsy car or drone, and same with those things. And that was actually like the first version of this thing back here. And so the beginnings of this thing were pretty humble, but it was mostly like how do we how do we spend as little money as possible just building something for ourselves? And if you look at a lot of companies that um, you might admire, a lot of those things started by building something for like a problem that they had themselves. Right? This wasn't like a cool idea that was gonna be a big company, it was something we wanted that we could build for ourselves, but we saw that it wasn't something we could buy. We could have bought this before. So we couldn't have built it. And so um, one piece of advice is you know don't spend a lot of money and don't try to come up with ideas. The best ideas are the ones that are going to kind of come to you because of the unique things that you know, problems that your friends have, problems that you have, and like what you're going to solve them. And some of them might be good and some of them not. Um, so, so the prior project um, from this one was uh, my, my co-founder John was holding this thing, had turned his family uh, Christmas tree into a rocket um, and had just was bored at Christmas and decided to make a video about shooting this thing like 100 feet. Rocket uh, not a viable commercial product, as you can imagine. Um, but, but this thing was, and it was totally by accident. People were starting to chase us and say, hey, where do I get that thing? Um, and how do, I, how do I buy one? Um, and so we ended up building this, and it was kind of the very first prototype of this thing. Again, it was not meant to be uh, kind of a finished product in any sense of the word. Uh, like we had to know how to do the engineering this to, to get it there. Um, and it also resulted in some, some fun testing, so you can see a lot more blue tape. Uh, anyone here who's doing an intent engineering has the value of this case. So this is someone who's riding with a wheel just fell off while they were riding. 
Um, and, and there's just a lot of this kind of testing super early on. So this is not the stuff super. Actually, I don't think anyone's ever seen these pictures. So we can draw first to the um, and then this is the unglamorous side of taking photos like this. This is my co-founder Matt Subaru that's filled with a bunch of boards, half of which aren't working at like two in the morning or kind of um, So kind of the first lesson here is like if you're thinking about working on something interesting like this, and we certainly have this, a lot of these projects are really like it's not very glamorous. And I know it seems glamorous and we want to build something glamorous in the future, but at the beginning just like just have fun. Like that's actually the most important part. If it doesn't work out, the pressure that you're putting on yourselves to like make something as a company is actually way more pressure than you need. The first pressure you should have is just, is this something that like, I would do with uh, So that, that was kind of the first bit on this. Um, the second bit is this, make 10 users love you. Anyone has ever heard this before? It's better to have a few people who really love your product than a thousand people who really like you. Okay. So that comes from um, a guy named Paul Bukai. So Paul uh, was very early at the first 20 employees of Google. Uh, two notable accomplishments there, he came up with the Don't Be Evil. Slogan, which I guess is not as true these days. And the second is uh, he created Genome. Um, so two pretty decent things uh, that he did there. Uh, and, and then he left to go to Y Combinator, and he had this idea, which is if you're trying to build something, imagine you're trying to dig like a hole. Um, you can either build like a very you dig like a very large hole that's super shallow, or you could dig like a deep well. And so if you think about why you ever use something you've gotten, and it's like, all right, this is okay, but I'm not going to about it, you know, whether it's a restaurant or a product or whatever. And then sometimes you know you like find like a band or a restaurant or a product, you're like, this is the best thing ever. Maybe my friends think I'm crazy, but this thing is amazing. Um, and the idea is when you're starting something super small, it's better to make a few people really, really love your product and then try to expand because you can't do both at once. You can do both at once and try to do things. So um, we took this to heart. And actually, we were about to launch this thing on Kickstarter, and we got an advice to you. We were about to launch it on Kickstarter, and the best advice we got was office hours and they're like, hey, you know what? Um, uh, instead of instead of launching this thing, what if you just build five of these and sell them? We're like, that's not possible, this is a physical product, we have to do like plastic tooling and metal parts fabrication and the factory. And they're like, no, no, just build five of these things and see if anybody will buy them from you. Um, we're like, how will we sell them? They're like, just go try to sell them to people and you do them to the animal, uh, the time offered. Um, and, uh, and just try to see, like, we'll test your price point, we'll test if they use it. Um, and so we said, okay, like, we'll make our goal now to just make, you know, five or ten people really, really want to buy. Um, and so we spent the next two months building these, and these were the very first boosted boards that we sold. And we literally went to people and said, hey, will you buy this crazy thing? We hadn't built them yet. But we buy this thing. Uh, and they said, okay, how much? And how many people heard of Sam Altman uh, from YC? He's, like, one of the people who ran it. He's like a billionaire, he was probably a billionaire at that point too. He was like, no, 1200 bucks is way too much. I paid him. I'm like, okay, you can't build it for 1200 Okay. And that was the whole conversation. And so you actually learn like what it's like to actually sell the product. And a lot of people think sales is like the ad that you see with like a flashy photo, with a marketing copy or something like that. When actually it's just like, can you get someone to give you money? And getting someone to give you money is the ultimate test because like your mom is really gonna like me. Show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, it's going to sell everywhere. Like your friends will say that too. They don't want to be mean to you. Um, and if you give them away for free, people also want it. But as soon as you make them pay for it, they'll tell you all sorts of things, whether you want to do them or not, about whether this thing's really working for them. So we charged every single person for this thing. We didn't really actually need the money to do it, but it was a test. And so we built these five. We had to figure out how to do them. So we, we uh, rented some space in a machine shop um, called Tech Shop. We did a membership up. We built these things. These only for twelve hundred bucks each. And they broke all the time. Um, and so we're like, okay, we gotta we got fix those. And so this is maybe, in each of these photos, I know like, things maybe seem like they don't quickly enough, but things take a long time. Each of these photos is like six months apart. This is like a lot of work. So this was uh, us sharing an office that we got almost for free um, from another company that we were, that had too much space. We basically built a bunch of these things and actually figured out how to sell these. Um, and so these are the first people that we had by the uh, all, almost all of them I still talk to today. But the focus was really on, is this thing working for you? Is this thing actually doing what you need it to? So these, these over here, these things broke every, I don't know, two weeks or so. And we realized that to scale this thing out, for those of you who have this board and seen them, like, you know they're pretty reliable, so you can invest a lot into. These things were not reliable, and for them to be a vehicle, for the reason that you use for transportation versus just like a fun toy, they had to, they had to be something you could count on, and this wasn't period. So actually, the, the 
even though these look not that different, going from here to here was about like, I don't know, about a million dollars worth of like R and D work, and like having to hire all the friends that we could convince to work on this with us, like out of school, uh, and convincing some people to give us that million dollars, um, and developing like super safe batteries and motor control systems and all of that stuff. And we just like slowly did this over maybe like 15 months, 16 months. Um, and actually, ironically, at the time, uh, there was no law that we could find against shipping like a super dangerous looking battery, like super dangerous stuff. Like, we never <laughs> want to put it anywhere else. So like that's really weird. But there's no law that's legal for us to do that. And then two years later, a lot of work stuff happened. And all that. And we're like, oh, okay, we should be lost. <laughs> um, so, so the amount of effort it took to get into this, but if you notice, there's not that many. Right? There's really only about 10 or 15 in this photo. And the number of people that we sold these to was very limited. Like, people wanted more. And there was a specialist effort at it. And if you've like, done Kickstarter campaigns or seen people done before, it's like, oh, how much did you raise on Kickstarter? You did like a million dollars on Kickstarter, half a million dollars on Kickstarter. And it's really easy to get caught up in, you know, that part of it. And instead we focus on is like who are these people, how are they using it? Um, and we did some really weird things. Like we said, if you don't like it, we'll give you a full refund and we'll pay you a little more. And what that it sounds nuts, right? Because all of you are like, I will definitely buy that from you and, and get that money back, right? Um, but what these people said was like, no, actually I would have paid more for this thing. And one principle that often gets lost a lot of startups and a lot of ideas is you're like, well, I want to get as many people using this as possible, so I'll give it away for free. I'll give it away for cheap. Um, there's a lot of things like Uber is like this, right? Like we'll give it away for less than it, it, uh, it actually costs us. Um, not very good to do, do as a public company, but um, but when you're small, you have that temptation. And what we found is that people were really paying more for this, and it meant that they were getting it. Right now. And that was super important to figure out. Um, so, so that turned into this, which is uh, there's a difference between something seeming good and being good. And a lot of companies are looking at how do I make this thing seem good to you? I'm going to sell you a new iPhone. It's going to seem like the best thing ever. Now, in the case of the iPhone, generally they tend to be pretty good. Uh, but a lot of products try to market ahead of where they are. Um, and then you end up kind of getting disappointed with people who have been disappointed with, like, this was over promised to me. Um, so this sort of been investing. If you've read Zero to One, uh, which is Peter Thiel's book on, on uh, investing, he talks about you wanted to invest in companies that seem like a bad idea and are a good idea. Uh, so for example, uh, Airbnb, uh, when it started, like, it was the worst idea. It's actually two bad ideas, right? It's stay in a stranger's house and let strangers stay in your house. <laughs> um, and so most people would be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. And I think a bunch of people passed on investing, what was it, like $200,000 out of like a million dollar valuation or something. A bunch of people passed, like, oh, this is that would have been worth whatever, $2 billion. Um, so that's the point that you want to invest if you're thinking about financial investment. Is how, do you, how do you invest when it's not priced correctly, and instead you're, you're kind of getting a good deal? And so from a product design perspective, you really want to be looking at how do you make something that um, maybe seems okay, but you're over delivering? And if you've worked on some products or you've like even a place, you're like, man, this place doesn't seem like it'd be that delicious, but it is. Those are the places that have wine. And the places that are like, man, the ambiance is great, the food is total crap. Uh, that's, that's the optimist, right? That's the tourist um, So a lot of what was glamorous kind of early on in, in this stuff was uh, pictures like this of us like figuring out how to build like 10 or 20 women at a time. Um, this took a whole other level of engineering, having to you know, hire a bunch more people that we didn't, that we didn't know and have to come to come work with us to build these. And that turned into this. And then we had to figure out how to ship these things to Amazon and ship these things to other places. It was very kind of slow in the game. And now this picture here, which represents about, gosh, I want to say maybe like a week's worth of work, a week's worth of production at steady state. That's probably like what I can sell at this point for two hours. Uh, but getting to the point where these are all like handwritten and mm -hmm. like being um, um, But the most important thing is this. So, um, <laughs> right? I mean, like, that's crazy. I can tell you that about a thing that you kind of built with you know, two years earlier, three years earlier. Um, amazing product, love it more than my Tesla. I've been riding almost every day for two months, but almost zero problems. See that? All that, all that reliability work. The only things that have gone wrong, belts are slipping an expert mode and I break and the rubber cover over the charger and starts one same place, other than this is perfect. Um, my brother bought a boost board a month or two ago. He wasn't interested in it because of the price. 
no way was I going to drop that much money for the longboard, but I went for a visit over for two minutes on the streets of San Francisco and immediately sold them to the price anymore. Uh, I spent the next week or two doing some additional research on which model to buy customer support overall for the company as a whole. And then my husband rides us every day, even he had no idea how much he could enjoy this. It's so well made, durable, much faster than engine well worth the um, But these are things if you look at the dates, right? 2015, 2018. We were trying to figure this stuff out with 10 people back in 2012, 2013. And by investing in those things early, we set ourselves up to do this. And that's the really key thing. It's like you can buy this, you, know, you can pay people to leave their reviews, and you can like pay influencers and things like that. Um, how many people here have watched like Casey Neistat's vlogs? Okay, you know that, that he likes to use the boards. So we also, I mean, let's see. So I, I met Casey, I met Tony Hawk. Um, uh, was Kanye wanted a booster board, of course. <laughs> um, but they all wanted them for free. That's the cool part. In Casey, we made them pay for it. And that's the real test. If someone's willing to pay for that thing, you know they have And there's a couple communities, actually Tesla does this too, like you can't get a free Tesla, no matter who you are. Uh, and charging people for something like that, again, kind of comes back to that, like if it's that good, we would rather have five customers, uh, all of whom really want to think we're going than 10 customers, of which you know, three of them are like, yeah, this thing's not really safe, and two of them are like, I hate this thing. We'd rather have fewer customers. And so, in consumer electronics, it shows up a lot if you've ever had like, a Fitbit or a GoPro that's like sitting in a drawer you know, three months or six months uh, after you've had it. Uh, we've seen people have that. Like, we needed people in stuff that, at least from my perspective here, at least the people are actually using. But all of this work, which you and then we're spending 50 or $100 million of development and the cost of all the single product is super high, we were able to figure this thing out much more cheaply. And so then also if you fail, you're also failing much more cheaply. You're not going to help for as much money. Um, it's like, oh, it didn't work out. You know, it's investing. Investors are much more willing to forgive changes to a business and we put a million dollars in it. Um, so this was the result of some of that. Um, and the last thing which is kind of interesting is aligning the so, um, I think of some examples on campus. You know how sometimes, like a, like a professor, you know how like grading groups for classes are sometimes not actually aligned with like the thing. It's like what's going to make this easy for the prof, or what's going to make this easy to grade, or what's what's whatever curve has to get satisfied. But you actually learn the stuff and not be totally tied to the grade that you get, or how well you know it. Um, so aligning incentives is super powerful. Has anyone here heard of uh, Lambda School? So Lambda School is this interesting coding bootcamp where you don't pay to take it, but you, they take a cut of your income after uh, you get a job. And so the incentives are very aligned between them teaching you how to be good at it and then getting paid later. And it's not like we just want to get paid now for you to take a class and you go and if, you, if you're not good at it, it's, it's not else's problem. It's very aligned. So a couple things that we did here, kind of by action. Um, so the first thing was orange wheels. So I don't know if anyone here has a board with orange wheels. Some people put around and kind of move away from some of these. Uh, but you know how a lot of these have orange wheels. So the reason that we had orange wheels on our board was uh, kind of an accident. And then it turned out people were like, we got to copy orange wheels. We want to copy these, so we're going to copy orange wheels. So these are four different competitor boards, all of which we were terrified of. Like, we're like, oh my gosh, people are competing with us. Um, all of which decided orange wheels were definitely that's, that's what people are buying. Um, they forgot to copy this part. Um, and so, uh, so for example, like having a customer support line where if you call, they would just pick up the phone, that was crazy. Like that was not something that all these copycats would do. Um, and so they're copying the wrong things. Um, when you think about like your incentives as a company and your customers' incentives, we were trying to keep it very tightly aligned. Where, you know, us taking care of you was the reason for coming back. So if you've ever like, gone to like a genius bar in an Apple store or like this bag that I have and stuff from a company called Peak Design. Like companies that intend to pay a little bit more for sometimes they actually take much better care of you. And that's that's how it's um, so so that's around the competitive side. And the other one which was really interesting was Reddit. So um, so Reddit, this is a screenshot actually from today. Uh, so there's like twenty thousand subscribers in the subreddit. And uh, what was interesting was we decided to do something very odd, which like no company, no no lawyer would have ever recommended, which was we we opened up this like subreddit. We said you could post anything you want as long as it wasn't spam about competitive products. 
Um, but if you said you had like a dangerous situation, you had a defect in your product, if you had like something that bad to say about us, if you want to cuss me out personally, you could do that. You could put it up there and we link to it from our own page. And what was super interesting about that, like I don't think you've ever seen a company ever do that. What's interesting about that is it, it really makes you honest. Like you can't hide from customer from providing that customer service uh, to, to your life. So if people say, hey, you know what my real fell off was, right? You can't hide from that. And that's what's super interesting about these principles. You say, oh, we're transparent, you know, put the customer first. And that's like easy to say when things are going well. It's really hard when like the whole front page of that subreddit is sort of me. Then you're like, all right, we just gotta solve the problem, gotta figure out you know, what it is they're upset about and actually solve those things and communicate with them. Um, and so this was actually a random weird thing. And the, one of the co-founders that ended up investing, Alexis Payne, um, who's now not famous because his wife is Serena Williams. He's <laughs> wife, which is great. Um, but but aligning the sentence between like us not hiding from our users actually led to a lot of much higher quality customer service. Because if it was bad, it was bad. If it was good, the whole team got instant feedback. Like, all right, we're actually taking care of people. We're super stoked. We got people actually posting. You know what? I had a really good experience for no reason at all. Like, normally you write a review when you want to write a bad review. When you're writing good reviews, you're like, I expect this. And people are just like, yeah, this is great. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, you know, um, uh, Dan. The different people who are on the customer show. So, aligning incentives with this was super interesting. Um, so that, that's kind of the boosted stuff. I mean, it was super interesting building this up. Um, I, ironically, uh, you all get this. So, and actually, no one. I think I'm going to do some. I'm going to do some. Uh, ones. So this is a girl I really liked who lived in Clark Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> and I was living in Foot Health, and then I was living outside. Like, it's just not going to work. <laughs> like I couldn't get that. Like I had a bicycle stolen in my two days. Uh, you obviously can't drive. I didn't have like, a moped. Do you have to still live in Clark Kirk and use like mopeds and buses around campus? Like, so that was like that was happening then too. And I was like, I I can't. Study with you if you're like half an hour. So no one, no one quite got that, but I definitely have written this thing up first uh, and realized, like, you know, for those of you who've written this thing on campus, it's going to be similar. Like, you can get on campus a bunch faster than this. Um, so some of the cool things we learned. So one of them was people said, you know what, uh, this thing changed my life. And the reason they said that is because, you know, if you think about a radius of maybe two miles or three miles around you, it's pretty hard to actually cover that distance effectively. Like, like driving and ride share like, does not make sense in those distances, especially like, in a dense, congested area. Um, walking is like, a little bit too far. You can do it, but then you're talking about you know, an hour or 45 minutes or a minimum. Um, and if you think about rent, like, if you think about the rent you know, five blocks off campus versus two blocks off campus, like, it's less expensive. That's because people know that they're going to pay more than two blocks off campus. And so getting someone something like this, especially if it's reliable enough to be financing and get about 50 bucks a month, if you're spending like 200 bucks a month less on rent as a result, it's a completely different thing. And so that was one of the interesting things we found out from talking to users. There were basically two kinds of people who bought. The first kind were super wealthy adrenaline junkies who bought jet skis and like all the sports cars. And they were like, oh, this thing's great. And then the other people were people like college students who said, you know, I get to live in a different place because of this. Um, or I can now go see friends that I wasn't able to see as often, or I can go to a class or I can you know, go to high school somewhere different. So that got me working on, on SCIP, the idea of you know, how, do you, um, uh, how, how do you make this thing more accessible to people? And the idea behind Lucid was, okay, we've got the skateboard, there's now a scooter, it's a very expensive scooter, it's 1600 bucks, so it's not super accessible to the broad population, but if you could pay like three bucks a ride for this thing, and use that to get around the city, how would that work? Um, all of you have heard of like, companies like Bird and Line and all those things, right? So we started at the same time with a different approach of building the from the ground up, using all the lessons from this. So this is our new scooter, which is going to be on the road, um, starting, I want to say in two weeks, um, in a few cities, and then we're going to start testing it. But it's the first one kind of built entirely ground up as opposed to using stuff that's like optional. Um, but the reason it's got really obsessive, and kind of the lesson here is, um, this is San Francisco, this is why I want this. This is uh, how long it takes you to get to the Caltech station in San Francisco at rush hour on Thursday. Um, whether you're using a car uh, or something like a scooter or a boosted board. And red is where the car is, uh, the car is faster and blue is where the car is slower. And this is not surprising. Like, you can imagine trying to get to a party where the car is like that. Um, 
So this is what got me super interested in this. And I said the lesson here for all of you is uh, there was no point in my career at Cal where I was like, oh, I really want to work on this thing. Like, uh, I, I had taken a class on Padma, and I think I fell asleep after the first or second class. I think this is boring. So I started working in the music, I was like, I want to learn everything I can about Padma. This is so cool. Mm -hmm. And you never know, like, you, I would never have guessed that this is the kind of stuff that would make for me. So for those of you who know like, exactly what you want to do, which I did, that may not be true. And for those of you who don't, like, it's totally fine. You might find this completely by accident. Um, so I've been really obsessed with this problem. I've been working on it for now, I guess, eight years. Um, we want to figure out how to give access to a three mile or five mile radius to anybody. Like, what would it take to do that? To like my parents, to someone who's like 15 years old. How do you make them feel safe? And the best way to do this is small electric like, vehicles. And there's a lot of work that's going to happen in the next couple of decades, essentially on bike lanes, better vehicles, safe, safe technology, things like that. Are going to happen, but it has to because the cities are not going to get more car lanes. Ride sharing is not going to solve the problem. But I'm going to go park. Um, and so if you think about the technology stack of the vehicles, um, so right now there's, you know, if, if you're building a car, you have to build like a battery and brakes and a chassis. Um, you might, you know, if you're an electric car, you've got you know, power train control, battery train control. This is like what Tesla is building right here. And then if you're building autonomous vehicles, you're kind of getting into this portion, which is, you know, is there a really fancy processor on board, a bunch of sensing and cameras and radars. And then if you're doing something like Uber and Lyft are doing, you're basically just building a bunch of apps on top of on top of a um, But the question that we have to ask ourselves if we're going on is like, what is an electric vehicle? And is it a small thing like a booster board actually? So it's funny because I never actually did this diagram for boosted board, but this is actually how we thought about it. So uh, if you ever had a car smog or gone with your parents to get like, a car smog, you plug the cable underneath the, uh, the steering wheel. So the boosted board actually runs the same common protocol as a car. Uh, which no one really can know, it's like it's just a skateboard. Um, but the idea of this being a pretty complex system that you have to you know, design and architect just like what a car, a lot of people said, man, this can't be a vehicle, it's a scooter, it's a, it's a skateboard, it's a toy. And what we realized is that it's getting you from one place to another and it's reliable and you know, without it, you're not going to get to class or get to work or go to the or whatever else. There's really no difference between what we call a car being a vehicle or what we call something much smaller. Um, and so we've been really working on trying to say this is a question the city should be asking um, when they think about planning for transportation. Instead of saying, hey, we want to regulate the menace of scooters or the menace of electric skateboards, um, mm -hmm. they don't want to talk about the menace of cars and the menace of like, how many people are actually killed or injured by car accidents and you know, pedestrian car interactions uh, in cities. Um, they're like, oh no, someone crashed on a scooter, you must be out. And so we've been working on how to answer this question. So we've been investing a lot, this actually takes a lot of work to as well into designing systems around servicing and maintenance of the vehicles. So this is like a workflow that you might use for um, manufacturing something instead of maintaining all the scooters. So we make sure they're on the road and it's ever safe instead of treating them as what it's supposed to do. Uh, and let's see actually, this is a single day uh, of fixing about a thousand scooters for various kinds of diagnostic issues and then back on the road. So you can all disappear and get on that far end there. So that would be uh, and then we monitor all of these. And so this is basically our back-end dashboard for every vehicle, everything in green is on the ride. Uh, everything with the wrench bikes is like fixed, everything with the little charge that needs to get charged. So this is how all these systems are running in the back end. You have a cube dashboard that you can look at to say, uh, we want to know where this trip occurred so we can refund that ride. We want to know what version of software is running on every subsystem, every processor is running on the vehicle. We have to move things from one to another. So we do a lot of this in the city. So this is where this stuff is all going. Uh, it would have been tough for me to predict when I was in here to see that like, this is what I do So. Um, yeah. My advice is like this all started just kind of working on fun stuff to avoid my homework. Uh, so <laughs> I guess keep doing that. Here you are. Um, yeah.
So I wanted to begin with where you talk and then speech with Skip. Since Lyme and Bird entered the school market, 11 competitors have done so as well in the last few years. Given the rapidly expanding nature of this market, how does Skip differentiate, differentiate itself? Yeah, there's two areas that we focus on. So the first one is there's a conversation happening in technology right now about can you trust companies data, can you trust companies to do the right thing, can you trust companies to treat their employees well. And especially in the student industry more than almost any other one, it's very heavily regulated devices. So unlike a lot of companies where you kind of being able to launch ahead of time and see you can't necessarily track your progress and get much larger, with scooters they can basically shut you down right away. And scooters are kind of unique. So one of the things we've invested in is uh, government relations and working with people that are really experienced in working with cities on how to be compliant, how to be transparent, how to be a company that all cities can trust to do the right thing. And it turns out when you're in a competitive employment process with uh, other types of companies which are much larger, especially using tactics that have proven effective in industries like ride sharing, um, we often have found ourselves able to be effective in winning and winning the events relative to us. That's the best one. And the second area is on hardware. And so we believe that um, fundamentally, unlike ride sharing, where you're kind of, you know, a Prius has to work for a few to work. Uh, in this case, there is no Prius yet in the Model T era of these vehicles, and so you have to be able to control the entire thing like that, whether it's battery safety, whether it's battery safety, whether it's longevity of your the vehicle or supply chain, so all those things you have to control yourself, and that's an amazing thing. So as a result, you know, we can go around this in terms of our profitability. Those are two areas where we're going to improve. In terms of maintaining this more collaborative approach, how do you what if any are the challenges of employing this approach as compared to approaches perhaps used by your competitors? Yeah, so I would say um, kind of along that the line incentives piece, and one thing we do is we we tell uh, cities when we have problems with things as opposed to pretending that everything is going really well. So for example, if we have an issue with the fleet safety in Washington DC, we'll tell some of this or vice versa. And so uh, that's above and beyond the regulations. But what that ends up doing is creating a set of, of standards and expectations for the cities that then becomes a new set of regulations. So they end up coming to us saying, hey, how should we regulate safety? How should we think about that? So one example is um, this new vehicle uh, with the S3 scooter um, has a swap in the battery pack. And in that battery pack is a humidity sensor, which we never have in blue scooters. So with the humidity sensor, we can detect if there's a broken water seal, or if there's mechanical damage in the pack that allows the water to get in. So for uh, short, and it becomes a battery fire. Uh, if we can detect that with our backend system, so we can basically pull that vehicle off the road for the space. And so working with cities to kind of set up the how that works, and that's like one of the examples where, um, where we can kind of teach them and give them the tools they need to regulate the service system. And that ends up also being some of the city work. Focusing in on this idea of aligning incentives, in your speech you also talked about aligning incentives with the customers themselves. What challenges have you faced in terms of having such an open presence with the Reddit and just maintaining that relationship with customers with their help? Oh yeah, um, I mean it's really easy when stuff is going well to have principles. It's much harder when things are not going well. That's when it really tests and it's really uh, inconvenient. Uh, like everything is telling me you want to not be transparent or, uh, or not put the customer first. And so the hardest points have been where it's been deeply uh, uncomfortable for us. And we've said, well, but it's who we are. And so that's what we have to do. And so an example of this is back in 2016, with Booster, we had, um, we just were shipping our new, you know, the V2 at the time, second gen board. We had one battery pack uh, basically start smoking in someone's apartment. It didn't, you know, didn't catch on fire and we were really, really worried about it. Um, and of course, they threw it in the construction dumps where the only ones that like, sit around for, for years. And like literally three hours later, the dumps were just all the way like, okay, we can't get that battery back. Um, so we couldn't figure out what's wrong with it. We needed another one out. And so nobody was hurt. There's no property getting up to it. We had to decide. We keep shipping these. We keep um, selling these. And, you know, it took us maybe three or four minutes to say, you know what, like, we're going to stop and fix the problem. And financially, it really hurts. 
but I wanted a company that was super aligned that this is the right thing to do. And our customers really trusted us and built a lot more trust moving forward. So in the end, it's, it's often good, but in the moment, it's good. Safety concerns have often dominated criticisms of micro mobility vehicles, with some arguing that these vehicles increasingly utilize spaces that were specifically built for people who are disabled. How, if at all, can the growth of micro mobility be cognizant of the intended use of these spaces in combination with cities and other governments? Yeah, that's something we spend a lot of time on. So, um, how many people here have like stayed on Airbnb before? Okay. Have you ever been told like, hey, don't tell them that you're a guest, just like pretend you're my cousin or something? Or they weren't ever heard that before, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, or, like you're just visiting my town. So, if you think about Airbnb as like a marketplace, you've got a guest in the place, um, but you've also got a neighbor. And the neighbor is not necessarily like a part of the transaction, but they're definitely participating in what's going on, and you're taking that account. And for a lot of micro-ability, more so than I think other transportation um, uh, startups and, and ideas, the neighbor, like there's a rider that's going to be close to the neighbor of life. And that neighbor might have kids, they might have pets, they might be disabled, or wheelchair, they might be blocked by their parking this thing. And definitely in some cities uh, that are larger, there's less of a sense of like, neighbors and others. And a thing that we can do as companies is to say, look, maybe we should be listening to people who don't do that. Because actually the right thing to do in the long term is to build a system that isn't half of our city loves it and half of it hates it. But the half it's on time using is actually supportive of like of what the end goals are. So for example, in San Francisco, um, we created a community advisory board specifically inviting people who hated scooters to come meet with me and other people on our team roughly like once every six to eight weeks. So they can get it. And they can say, hey, like, this sucks, this is terrible, this is blocking my sidewalk, this is, you know, you know this ramp of why aren't we solving these problems? And then we can, we can have that conversation. But a lot of people feel like we don't get hurt. You know, if, if they're, if the only thing they can do is, is talk on Twitter or email a representative or go to some council meeting, then they feel like there's no connection. There's actually by inviting people who don't like our product to spend time with us. It helps us build products that are for them and not just for our users. It helps make it so that our users better because that they're, you know, they're not getting that side. In San Francisco itself, MTA studies have shown that micromobility vehicles are increasingly, well, most of the time, used by people who are wider Asian, higher income, and generally male. Given your goal of sustainability and accessibility, how, if at all, should the micromobility space change to account for bringing in more people? Yeah. Um so the reason that's true in San Francisco is because that's the demographics of San Francisco. Um, San Francisco is predominantly white and Asian and male in the densest, most expensive, and highest cost of areas. If you look at my ability to use, including from us in places like Portland, or Oakland, or Washington, D.C., you see a cut across a much broader swath of the population that generally reflects um, kind of the football um, I think the students in San Francisco is specifically because the places that are higher income, so higher cost of living, tend to be much more congested. So, financial district or Eastern uh, part of Santa. And those places, um, so kind of, you know, also places where students are best for getting around the traffic and the traffic. Whereas places that are more diverse from like the Hispanic population, the African American population, actually have very bad kinds of access. And they don't have bike lanes, they have much more sparse, less dense, less congested um, uh, transport kind of road systems. And so you actually don't put scooters in nearly as much as you would otherwise because the usage is not as high. Uh, we hear people say, you know what, like, it's not, it's, you know, there's no bike lane that will save the cars are going by at 40 miles an hour, towards in five hours and the cars are shopping at the much. So generally what we're seeing is the demographic side is skewing younger. Uh, obviously, like our parents are not kind of the most dominant users of, of micro-ability, but they're getting it. And actually, I think there's a lot about the increased number of human factors that we have. Not just someone you stand on, someone you sit on, or someone who has more than two wheels. To increase the accessibility of the platform. Where, if at all, then, do you see micro-mobility fitting into larger systems of transit, such as with public transportation or ride share systems? Yes, there, there's two ways you can look at it. The first is, um, Multimodal, what we call it vehicle to vehicle. So, boosted board, you can fit in the trunk of the car, you can take it on BART with you, it's very easy to carry around with you, and it's kind of designed uh, uh, with that in mind. 
So, I mean, you can imagine, like, if you had, like, a phone, and this phone was, like, slightly too large for your pocket, but it would, depending on the pants I'm wearing, I might be able to carry this one or not. You have to really design the product around how it's going to be used. So there's a whole class of micro mobility vehicles, whether they're skateboards, folding scooters, folding bikes, that really do fit into other kinds of vehicles. And there's another class of vehicles that really want to use for connecting. So, if I want to take BART from the city, but my destination is actually a mile and a half away from BART, I may choose not to use BART at all, because, you know, it's actually just easier to drive, it's easier to use my ship. Whereas if you have my mobility stationed at that BART station, that's reliable and dependable, then people can say, you know what, I will take BART into the city to go to that place, because I know for sure that I'm um, So I think there's opportunities to both uh, connect into public transit systems and come out the other side, so I can bring a boost of support onto BART or the opportunities to kind of build transit cars around existing power existing stations, existing power stations, as opposed to, uh, you know, we can expand those stations and the time. So. In terms of fitting into these systems of transit, one of your stated goals for a company such as Skip is to build greater environmental sustainability in transportation. Given the larger national conversation about sustainability, how do you think companies such as Skip and Boost fit into reducing the environmental impact that people have on the environment? Yeah, so, um, so I think one aspect of that is uh, you have to appeal, even though it's very tempting to say like people should, uh, it's very easy for, for you to say other people should include the impact on the environment. It's much harder for you to say that about yourself. Um, it's much harder to make a sacrifice around that. And so we found it's actually the best way to get people to ride a much lower, you know, watt hour per mile vehicle or boost of it is to make it really comfortable. Make it really fast. So another example of this in car industry is Tesla. So people were talking about electric cars as a moral impairment for years. And then Tesla said, no, we're going to appeal to like kind of the same distance that you can have in a expensive sports car. And use that to drive people and say, oh, well, actually, I can't get an expensive sports car and brag to my neighbors about it. Uh, oh, and by the way, I'm also super. <laughs> and, and so like appealing to that is very powerful, whether it's you know, computing, whether it's transportation, sustainability. And so one, one aspect of this is you've got uh, to figure out how to make these things that people want to use, and then that will drive it. And then the second part is you have to be honest uh, and not do this called greenwashing, which is kind of pretending that something is more sustainable when actually the back end of it is not. And so whether that's ride sharing, saying, you know, hey, we're reducing driving trips, but actually we're actually doing more so than all the downtime. Right. But you have to be looking at the whole picture, and that's going to be all. For the sake of time, this will be my last question before we move into audience questions. There are many avenues for companies to receive funding from venture capitalists, include, and as well as from platforms such as Kickstarter, which I believe boosted itself. What is the difference in the role that these sources play in the way that startups develop? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good writing on the I would say like funding sources should kind of be matched to what the goals of the company are. So uh, to give you an example, this bag is, is built by a, a friend of mine, and I think they're like the most funded Kickstarter company ever. Um, at this point, they really like camera and, and soft goods, and they've not never raised it to my knowledge with any capital. If they had raised any capital, they would probably be in a very bad position because the expectation of any capital investor is to get 10x back on money uh, within a 10 year time frame, and so you have to be pursuing very high growth. Uh, you know, business plan. Whereas uh, some companies that they don't raise venture capital and try to bootstrap uh, might fail in a high growth. So it really depends on the business and depends on the goals of the people who are trying to make sure they're laying up how you're 